Dear Muslims, barely a few days are left before the blessed month begins. And while many of us are excited and counting the days and looking forward to the month, perhaps some amongst us are not feeling that level of enthusiasm just yet. Perhaps some amongst us might even be anxious or dreading it, not because of the worship or the brotherhood, but because we are worried that how are we going to perform our jobs? How are we going to do our schedules? We might get headaches because of the lack of food. We don't have our afternoon coffee. And so this feeling of not feeling enthusiastic, this feeling of not being excited, and we see everybody else excited, shaitan comes to us and makes us feel like complete losers. If we're not as enthused as everybody else, shaitan comes and takes advantage and says to us, ah, you are not a real Muslim, you must be a hypocrite. The fact that you're not enthused means you are a failure as a Muslim. Dear brothers and sisters, this tactic of shaitan needs to be eliminated. While it is true that to be excited about the month is a good and healthy sign, it is not true that to feel a level of anxiety means you are a hypocrite. People are of different levels. And as long as the obligations that Allah has given are embraced, and as long as our bodies and our souls submit to the Sharia, ah, then Alhamdulillah, our level of Iman is green, it is good. Our level of Iman is healthy. In fact, brothers and sisters, we learn from the Seerah, we learn from the Quran, we learn from the biographies of the Sahaba, that not everybody is at the same level of enthusiasm. One of the most iconic incidents in the Seerah, right before the battle of Khandaq, the trench. It was a very difficult time. We don't have time to describe all of it. An entire month of being hungry, an entire month of being surrounded, you know, by enemies. And it was a windy and rainy and cold night. It was in the dead of the winter, freezing cold. And it was raining on top of that and the wind was blowing. And the Prophet ﷺ stood up and he said, who will volunteer? to go and spy upon the Quraysh in this middle of the night and then come back and tell me what is the update. Hudayfa ibn Yaman narrated, he said, in that crowd was Abu Bakr, Umar, Uthman radiallahu anhum. In that crowd was Talha and Zubair and Ali radiallahu anhum. And not a single person stood up. The Prophet ﷺ said again, who is enthusiastic? Who can go? And I promise him Jannah. But after one month of no food, in that desperate, cold and dark and bleak, not one person stood up. And then the Prophet wasallam said, Hudayfa, you stand up. That's why Hudayfa is narrating the story. Hudayfa said, I had no choice but to stand up. And why did Hudayfa say this? Because many decades later, he was sitting amongst a group of tabi'oon. And the tabi'oon were saying, Oh, if we had been alive at the time of the Prophet ﷺ, you would have seen what we did. You would have seen our level. You would have seen our enthusiasm. And Hudayfa said, Calm down. Hudayfa said, Lower your expectations. Let me tell you what happened with my own eyes. I will tell you. And then he went on and told the entire story. Brothers and sisters, it's okay to, at times, not be as enthusiastic. But when the time is called, when the Prophet says, Hudayfa, stand, and you must stand up, you have Iman. So Ramadan is coming. And when Ramadan comes, and we submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then Alhamdulillah, we have Iman. Allah reminds us in the Quran, Kutiba alaykum al wa huwa kurhul lakum. Qital has been prescribed for you. You are told to go and fight the Quraysh, it is qital. You must go and fight them. But your hearts hate doing this. Notice, Allah describes for us the Sahaba, the Krem de la Krem, the best of the best. They didn't want to go and do qital against the Quraysh. And Allah told us, you don't like it, but you're still going to do it. And it is possible you don't like something, and it is good for you. So sometimes a commandment is difficult. Sometimes, an obligation, we find our anxiety increasing. But as long as we obey and submit, as long as we hear and we comply, 
then alhamdulillah we are upon good let not shaitan come to you just because you're not in the top one percent and say you're a failure no if you comply and if you fulfill the wajibat then alhamdulillah you are a success not a failure umar ibn khattab radiallahu an said these hearts of ours they have ups and downs our hearts have ups and downs. So, when the heart goes up and it does the nawafil, that is good. And if it goes down, listen to this, and sticks to the fara'id, it is still in the good. This is Umar radiallahu an saying to us. Not everybody can pray to hajjud. Not everybody can go the extra mile. But as long as we do what is obligatory, it is still good. It is alhamdulillah in the clear. Ali radiallahu an said, Inna nafsa, our souls, they have the times of rising and they have the times of falling down. So when the time rises and we do the best and we do the azima and the ibadah, then that is good. And when the time falls short and we stick to the wajibat, then we are upon good. As long as we don't go below the wajibat, and Ibn al-Qayyim, that great master of the soul, he said, every single person journeying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he has phases. This is Ibn al-Qayyim, who is the master of the diseases of the soul. He has written multiple books that talk about spirituality. And he himself confesses, look, we're not all always at the same level. Everybody has phases. Sometimes good phases and sometimes weak phases. And then he himself says, as long as in the weak phase, Lam faraid, he doesn't leave the faraid, walam maharim, and he doesn't do the haram, an mimma kan. then it is hoped that he's gonna come back even stronger and better than when this phase began. So even in weak phases, as long as you are doing what is required, then insha'Allah it's resilience. And you're going to come back bigger and better and stronger. And that is the goal here, brothers and sisters. Ramadan is coming up. Some of us are excited and, and enthused. Others might not be that excited and enthused. But you know what? Alhamdulillah, as long as we're going to fulfill what Allah has required upon us, then insha'Allah ta'ala, we will share in the barakah of this month. And the barakah of this month is so much... It is so magnificent that even the one who's not enthused but still obeys and complies shall get a magnificent share. That share will be so magnificent that he shall have all of his sins forgiven and he shall start a new life after Ramadan. Even the one who comes begrudgingly and forces himself every day, I'm going to have to fast, every day I'm going to do the bare minimum. Even that person the barakah of Allah in this month, the rahmah of Allah in this month, the maghfirah of Allah in this month is so infinite, so much beyond count, that when every person stands up, some enthusiastically they're going to get the lion's share, and others begrudgingly, they will still get enough, such that this one month will make up for the entire year before this. Subhanallah, brothers and sisters, how blessed and fortunate we are. And so, some practical advice, insha'Allah ta'ala, for those amongst us that might be struggling. First and foremost, brothers and sisters, learn the priorities of this month. Learn what is more blessed versus that which is less blessed. Because when you understand what is the most blessed and you take advantage of that, then insha'Allah ta'ala, this will give you a level and a sense of peace and serenity that you will not get without this knowledge. The bare minimum that is required, and there is no going below this line, is that you must fast during the days and pray your five daily prayers. This is the bare minimum. There is no going less than this line. I know some amongst you are struggling with the five daily salawats. Use this as the opportunity. Because the fasting of the month is the third obligation. And the salah, salah is the second obligation. 
In fact, some would say the fasting is the fourth obligation and the salah is the second. It makes no sense that you are perfecting the fourth obligation and neglecting the second one. No, it makes absolutely no sense. So in this month, brothers and sisters, those of you who don't have the habit of praying five times a day, this is the month to change this habit. This is the month you will set for yourself the goal that I will pray the bare minimum. Even if I don't pray the sunnah and nafil, I will pray the bare minimum of my daily fara'id. And I will fast every single day. And if you do so, this insha'Allah ta'ala is the beginning of a new leaf for you. This is the start of a new life after Ramadan. Also realize brothers and sisters, again, know your priorities. Realize that Qiyam is indeed a very blessed thing to do in this month. But it is not obligatory and no scholar ever said it is obligatory to pray Qiyam in the masjid. If you pray Qiyam, and of course the concept of Qiyam in Ramadan itself is not obligatory, but it is strongly encouraged. It is very, very, very strongly encouraged. And it is number two after the fara'id and fasting. What's the next thing you should do? Pray every single night. But listen carefully. Praying every night does not mean you must come to our massages anywhere and pray two hours or three hours. It means every single night you pray extra salawat that you didn't pray before this night, even if it's at home. In fact, Imam Malik and many of the great scholars, they said it is more blessed to pray at home than in the masjid because when you pray, we're talking about the qiyam, the taraweeh, because when you pray the taraweeh or the qiyam at home, then you can make it as long or short as you want. You will have sincerity. You will make your own duas. You can go at your own pace. There's nobody watching you, so you have pure ikhlas. So Imam Malik would actually prefer to pray taraweeh in his home rather than in the masjid. Now again, for most of us, Coming to the masjid is far more convenient. We listen to a beautiful qari, we listen to the Quran, we have the community here. But my point is, if you cannot stand two hours, you know, for qiyam in most masajid, they do go long. By the way, inshallah, inshallah, our masjid, we're going to have a qiyam that is family friendly, eight raka'ah with it. We're going to try within the hour, and then whoever wants to continue will do the whole 20 after that. But we're going to try our best to make it uh, conducive to the family as well. Within the hour, we'll have our qiyam and our, tara and our uh, witr and a short khatira so that those who want to leave can leave, and then whoever wants to stay can stay after that. But many masajid don't have this option. Many masajid Sajid have an hour and a half, two hours, and many of us cannot come every single day. Okay, understand the goal is not necessarily pray in the masjid, the goal is to pray. So, wake up 20 minutes before you usually eat suhoor and pray those 20 minutes extra, and you have fulfilled qiyam. Or pray after Isha qiyam extra. Pray something you don't pray and do it continuously. Understand this is what is the desired goal, not necessarily coming to the masjid. Also understand brothers and sisters, priorities. Again, all of this is the first point that to pray Salat al-Fard in the masjid is more blessed than to pray the Nafila in the masjid. Hence, listen to me carefully. If you have limited time, and you cannot pray the entire taraweeh in the masjid. For you to schedule your salat al-fajr in the masjid and pray jama'ah in the masjid for fajr, it is exponentially more blessed than for you to pray taraweeh in the masjid and don't pray fajr in the masjid. Again, ideally you do both. But if you have to make a choice, learn your priorities. The priority is you pray the fard in the masjid. So if you must make a choice, then you pray taraweeh at home, you pray qiyam at home, and then because you now have extra time and energy, you will come and you will pray fajr in the masjid. Our Prophet wasallam said, whoever prays fajr in the masjid, Allah shall bless him as if he prayed the whole night qiyamul layl. This is a blessing of praying fajr in the masjid. My point is, learn the priorities of what is most blessed so that you concentrate on that. And of course, this khutbah isn't meant to go over the whole list, but inshallah, uh, do your research and ask and you will find inshallah ta'ala. The second advice I give myself and all of you, is consistency is the key. Schedule your worship. Make your actions of worship a part of your daily routine in Ramadan. Consistency. Just like you schedule your meetings in your corporate office, just like you schedule your errands and your chores, schedule your worship in a way that is conducive to your lifestyle. 
What time is it the most convenient for you to read 10, 15, 20 minutes of Quran? What time is it the convenient for you to wake up for tahajjud and qiyamul layl? You schedule it. Our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the most beloved of all deeds to Allah is that which is consistent even if it is small. Therefore, be realistic. Don't bite more than you can chew. Don't go berserk in the first week only to lose all of your momentum in the second week. No, start small and build your way up so that your maximum momentum will be in the last 10 days of the month. Start small and slowly but surely add to your routine after the first 10 days and then add even more in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. And also brothers and sisters, shaitan comes to us and makes us feel, oh, because we live in this land, which is a land where Islam is not practiced, we have it, you know, unlucky that we don't get days off, we don't have, you know, perks that we can, you know, back in the day you think once upon a time Muslims had Ramadan off. No, brothers and sisters, no. Do you think 100 years ago, 200 years ago, people could afford to take off from their daily routine? Never in Islamic history was Ramadan a month of vacation. No. Everybody went to the field and physically worked and labored in Ramadan and outside of Ramadan. People didn't have the luxury of vacations from earning their livelihood. Don't let shaitan come to you and say, oh, because I'm living in the West, there's no point. No. Do what you can. If you cannot take off from work, okay, the majority of mankind, the bulk of the ummah for most of its history could not take off from its work. Allah's not asking you to worship 12 hours non-stop. Allah's asking you to do more. So come home from work, take a small nap. It's sunnah to take a nap. Our process would take a nap in the day. Get some energy and then do something extra at night. That's the goal. Do something extra. Even if it's half hour of qiyam, 20 minutes of qiyam, read some Quran that you don't read regularly this is the goal brothers and sisters take on that which is reasonable and understand life doesn't stop for the continuous worship of Allah in fact in fact if you go to sleep in the day wanting to have energy to worship Allah at night your sleep is an ibadah your entire routine becomes an ibadah because in our religion whatever you do for the sake of Allah can become an ibadah so this is my second advice to myself and all of you be consistent even if it's small and put your schedule and your routine into your lifestyle such that you do what is reasonable with the obligations upon you. And my third and final point, brothers and sisters, for the first half of the khutbah, I advise myself and all of you to balance between community and between privacy. What do I mean by this? One of the aspects of Ramadan, we get caught up in the whirlwind of socialization. MashaAllah, every night in our masjid, we will have 3,000 people. Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah. MashaAllah, every day, most of you will be going and having iftar at somebody else's house, and then one day your house as well, as is the routine. Alhamdulillah. Enjoy the community. Thank Allah Azza wa Jal, we're in the post-COVID era, and we enjoy these blessings. Alhamdulillah. Establish those bonds of brotherhood and sisterhood. But you also need a break from this crowd around you. So I advise myself and all of you, every single day and every single night, cut off from everyone else. Go to the corner of your room, open up the Quran, and just you yourself, just between you and Allah. Before, before you break your fast, if you have the opportunity, go away and raise your hands to Allah and make a private dua. In the middle of the night, when everybody is asleep, go to a corner, nobody's watching you. Have that element of privacy. Because all too often, Ramadan, we forget that private moment. And so it just becomes a community, community, and that's good. But then without the private moment, we kind of neglect the other side. Because it's those private moments of contemplation. It's those private moments of thinking about, you know, what is my purpose? How can I be a better person? How can I increase my spirituality? It's those private moments that really allow us to rise and shine and in fact dare I say this is the essence of the sunnah before the prophethood and after the prophethood what is ghari hira the process would be in ghari hira during Ramadan except isolation what is i'tikaf in Ramadan except isolation what is i'tikaf the purpose of Ramadan, you cut off one of them, you cut off from socialization. Our Prophet for 10 days would literally cut off from family and friends, cut off from society, and just in the masjid, himself and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, not every one of us can do i'tikaf, but 
we can take on the spirit of i'tikaf every single day. The spirit of being alone, just raising your hands to Allah, having a moment of tadabbur of the Quran where nobody else is around you. You combine between community and between privacy. This is one of the ways you will inshallah ta'ala enjoy this month. Last point brothers and sisters, and again I said this before but a reminder is that Remember when you begin the race of Ramadan, remember you must store energy inside of you for the last sprint. When you see the finish line, that's when you need to raise the bar. That's when you need to show the best game you have. That's when you need to give it your 110%. All too often we go into the month and we burn ourselves out in the first five, 10 days. And that's not correct. We start slow, and routine. We increase the tempo in the next 10 and then the last 10 is when we give it our full 110 or even 200%. And this is where as well brothers and sisters, if you can, then make your life easier from now by logistically taking care of that which needs to be taken care of. We know what those last 10 nights are. We know on the calendar what they're going to be. If you can take a day or two off from work, excellent. Or if you can change your routine, excellent. Or if you can do some logistical chores such that you you don't need to do them at that time. Excellent. The point is from now, start planning your schedule. See what I can do in those last 10 nights. And as the month begins and you start the jog and you start the running, remember it's the last 10 where the actual sprint occurs. Brothers and sisters, Muslims, no matter how you feel about this month, we're all of different levels. But as long as we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as long as when the month comes, we begin our fasting and our prayers and our routine, then every single single one of us without exception can achieve the goals of this month. Every single one of us with small practical steps, we can make this Ramadan a time for having all of our sins to be forgiven and a time to begin a new state with Allah after the month of Ramadan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless me and you with and through the Quran and may he make us of those who its verses they understand and applies halal and haram throughout our lifespan. I ask Allah's forgiveness. You as well ask him for he is the Ghafoor and the Rahman.